A sudden draft from a window that was supposed to have been closed. A chill at the back of the neck. Groans, creaks, and bumps in the night. Man has always been frightened by the dark. Troubled by noises just beyond the reach of lights. Occurrences just beyond the reach of understanding. A very dark, hooded, evil presence came from the hall. I didn't even have to see her distinctly. I just knew this is trouble, you know, and I'm going to do something about it. A ghostly apparition in the dark of night. What was it? And why did it come? <laughs> An astonishing event occurred on a still summer night in a main fishing village. An event witnessed by the latest occupants of a house with a long history. An event which prompts tonight's search. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. There are stories of ghosts and of hauntings to suit every taste, from the playful to the macabre. But those who have studied ghosts claim to have discerned patterns in their behavior, what might be set down as rules of the haunt. For example, a ghost might be thought of as the spirit of someone who died in emotional turmoil. Further, it seems the spirit remains close to the place associated with the turmoil. Finally, it appears that the ghost wanders in its restless limbo until relieved of whatever its burden is. The best way to learn more about ghosts is to consult a ghost hunter. Hans Holzer understands the rules of ghostly behavior perhaps better than anyone else. It is his business to investigate hauntings. Holzer is a doctor of parapsychology and has written dozens of books on ghosts. Over the years, I've developed some pretty foolproof methods to explore the phenomena scientifically. I've used highly sensitive cameras and even more sensitive people, psychics, to get information which will lead to the discovery of a ghost. But in all my years of ghost hunting, I have never been afraid. After all, a ghost is only a fellow human being in trouble. Holzer may not be frightened by ghosts, but most of the people who call on him for help are. Perhaps this is because it is all so strange, because people instinctively fear what they do not understand. Ghosts are the surviving emotional memories of people who've died tragically and cannot leave the spot of their passing. They keep reliving their final moments over and over again, like a phonograph needle stuck in the final groove. You see, ghosts are not aware that they're dead. Ichabod Crane and the Headless Horseman came to life in the home and the work of Washington Irving. Some who care for the author's retreat think Irving may still be around himself. Holzer was asked to find out. It looked the part of a haunted house, all right. But the more I looked for hard evidence of a ghost, the more doubtful I became. Holzer had to pin down what had actually occurred in the old house. Well, I thought it was rather unusual one day. Our former librarian was reading Irving's will in the basement. And uh, all the interpreters were down there. And we suddenly heard a crash upstairs. We ran up. It sounded like someone had fallen down the steps. And when we got upstairs, there was an iron sitting in the middle of the laundry, fallen from the table. Ghosts have been known to do such things, but Holzer feels there must be a suitable motive. He talked to Joseph Butler, curator of the Irving Museum and Library. 
During your years here, have you ever heard of any legends alleging that ghosts or uncanny happenings abound here? Well, of course, Irving himself said that uh, when he died, he was sure that he would return to haunt Sunnyside as a friendly ghost. Irving's whimsical warning that he might return as a playful ghost didn't square with Holtz's experience, his knowledge of ghost behavior. The ghost at Washington Irving's cottage had no substance after all. But in the little fishing village of Port Clyde, I found a different kind of story. Port Clyde is a fishing village wedged in a rocky enclave of the main coast. Indians fished these waters long before the Europeans came. Then, for a time, the Yankee whalers held sway here. They were strong, practical men. Men steeled for long voyages in search of whale. They were replaced in time by fleets of cod fishermen, the same practical Yankee breed. Now it's lobster that lures the men of Port Clyde, but little else has changed. Making a living from the sea still demands courage and skill, and there's little time for frivolous pursuits and wild imaginings. Carl Schwab has fished Port Clyde's waters for years, a spiritual descendant of the Yankee whalers. He and his family once lived in a house that some in Port Clyde say is haunted. But had Schwab ever seen or heard anything unusual at the old house? Not unusual, not for winds here in the wintertime. <laughs> but I don't know much history of the house, <laughs> other than what this has come up. So you'd be perfectly happy to see. This is the ghost Carl Schwab was talking about. I first heard about it from brother and sister, Carol Schulte and Bob Olivieri. Carol and Bob had spent lazy summers with their parents in the Port Clyde house Carl Schwab once lived in. It was a fine retreat for the young people. A wonderful old house full of nooks and crannies and creaking wood. It was weather-worn, but comfortable. There was a night in the summer of 1972, however, which was not comfortable at all. It was the night Bob Olivieri became aware of a presence in his bedroom. One night, I was awakened by a noise in the hallway, like a pacing of footsteps. I had no idea what it was. I got up, and the sound stopped. And as soon as I got back in bed, I heard the noise again, these footsteps. I got up again, I came to the same spot, and it stopped. And so then I checked my parents' room, and they were sound asleep. I thought maybe it was my three-year-old nephew. I went down the hallway, and I checked in his room, and he was sound asleep in a crib, and my sister was sound asleep. So then I came back in bed again. Um, and while I was in bed, I got in bed, I heard the footsteps again. And um, they were coming up the hall, and they stopped. It seemed like it was at the edge of the hallway. And a few minutes later, I could feel something on my sheets, like a pressing, like someone pressing down. And there was nothing there, but I could see, I could see the sheets being indented. And it, it kept on coming up my body till finally at the end, something pulled my hair. And um, I was just scared for the rest of the night. I couldn't get to sleep. Carol, um what exactly happened to you in this house when you slept here one night? Okay, first of all, I was sleeping in this bedroom in here, which is um, generally my mother's and father's bedroom, but I just happened to be sleeping here that night. And I was in a deep sleep, and uh, my girlfriend was sleeping in that room with her animals. Now, one of her animals, a Siamese cat, came in and woke me up, or tried to wake me up several times, and I finally did wake up. I lie there and I thought, well, It'll go away, you know. And then it just kept rubbing against, like, my face and everything. So I was like this, and I sat up to turn this light on. I said, this is the only way I'm going to get rid of this cat, by turning the light on. And I sat up to do that, and I never got the light turned on because I sat up. I realized that there was a light there, 
And the cat, who was still here, was also looking at, you know, this light, which was right at this window. At first, I saw a little figure. It was female. And she had her hands up to her mouth, and so she wasn't quite sure whether or not she wanted to do it. She was very shy, you know, going like this. And, uh, of course, all this happened in a matter of split seconds. She got larger, and I realized that uh, definitely it was a female figure with a white, very, the brightest white I'd ever seen, nightgown on, and s very small shoulders, you know, slender. And I said, Marion? Marion? Carol awakened me in the middle of the night by calling out my name quite urgently. And I woke up, and the first time I heard my name, I didn't want to respond to it because it frightened me. And then she screamed out my name louder again, so. So I blinked my eyes again, and I realized that I could see through her. And I realized then that it wasn't Marion. And um, she right away started communicating to me through her hands. Now her hands started to go through washing movements. And um, she got larger as she came to me. Now, as um, I got uh, scared in direct proportion to her approach. <laughs> And I knew that she wanted me to do something. She was desperate in a way. And uh, at that point, I really was scared. And I uh, ducked under the covers, so to speak. And I just called Marion. And then she screamed out my name louder. And there was quite a note of urgency in her voice. So I got out of bed. And I went running across the hall to the room in which she was sleeping. And she clutched at me and said, Marion, I, I have just seen a ghost. And I believed her because it, it was very real. Past my fear, I sensed that there was something evil. There was an evil presence. If Bob, Marion, and Carol truly experienced a ghostly visit, then Hans Holzer must determine whose ghost was abroad that night and find a way to put it to rest. Hans Holzer is convinced there is merit to the eyewitness accounts of a haunting at Port Clyde. He has enlisted the help of psychic Ingrid Beckman for the next phase of his investigation. Ingrid works as a book designer for a New York publisher. She became aware of her psychic abilities, her special sensitivities to emanations, five years ago and has worked with Holzer on a number of similar investigations. She knows nothing about Port Clyde, the former occupants of the old house, or the circumstances of the haunting. Hans, immediately I feel uh, the presence of a woman. What about this room? Well, this presence uh, comes from another house that was on this property, so that I don't feel it in any particular room but I do feel um, that I should go upstairs because I think there'll be more up there. Hans depends on Ingrid's sensitivity to impressions of the past that may remain in the structure and to any non-visible emanations she may detect. As I go through this house, I can see in my mind's eye the house that was on the property before. And in my mind, I sense a field back in this direction. And there was land that went with this. Now we're upstairs. Uh, I want you to look at every room mm -hmm. and give me your impressions of it. Well, the upstairs is the most active. Um, I sense a woman who is waiting. And I have an impression now of a storm that she is very upset about. A gale of some kind. It seems to be November. Uh, I also feel that that she has looked out of not this very same window, but windows in this direction of the house. And I just got an impression where she says um, she, meaning a schooner, was built on the Kennebec, the Kennebec River. It seems to be a, um, oh, I think it's a double-masted, double-masted schooner. And it seems to be her husband who's on this. Ship registries of the 19th century confirmed that a whaler named Catherine sailed from these waters. Records of her crew, however, are lost. What does she look like? Uh, I see a tall woman who's rather thin and frail with dark hair. And it appears to be uh, a white gown. Could be a nightgown I see her in. 
looks like a nightgown to me with a little embroidery on the front. Hand done. Let us see if she cares to make contact All with right. us. We'll go back into that first room then. If the entity is present and wishes to talk to us, we've come as friends. She's very unhappy here, Hans. Um, she, she says her family hails from England. I get her name is Margaret. Um, Margaret what? Something like H, something of that sort. I'm not getting the whole name. What period are we in now? This is, now she says 1843. Uh, she's very unhappy because she wanted to settle in Kennebunk. She does not like it here. She doesn't like the responsibilities of the house. How did she get here? Her husband liked it in this fishing village. She was very unhappy about his choice. Now, is she here? She calls Kennebunk the city. That to her is a center. Why is she still here? She's left with all this responsibility. Her husband went, went on a ship. Her husband had a commission. What kind of a commission? On a, a whaling ship. What was the name of the ship? St. Catherine or St. Catherine's. The ship didn't come back? No. Where did they get married? In what church? Lutheran. Does she remember the name of the minister? Thorpe. Thomas Thorpe. When they were married, was that in this town? No. What town was it in? long way away, some kind of a province of a place. And they came right here after that? Went into Sacco. And then where did they move to? Clive, Clyde, Port Clyde. Now, she and her husband lived here alone? Two children. What were their names? Philip. But he went to sea. And the other one? Francis. Did he go to sea too? No. What happened to him? I think Francis died. What did he die of? I get cholera. What? Cholera. Cholera. And? He was 17. Ingrid has come up with some hard information about the ghost. The family name Hatton, the time they lived in Port Clyde, and a ship named Catherine. Holzer would eventually seek out the town historian, Colonel Albert Smaley, for corroboration. Now, to the best of your knowledge, uh, does the, the name Samuel and Hatton mean anything in connection with this area? Yes, Samuel Hatton uh, lived at Port Clyde uh, prior to 1850. That I'm sure about. What profession did he have? Sailor. Was there a ship called the St. Catherine in this yes, part? Yes, there was. And uh, would it have been built at the Kennebec River? Or uh, connected with it in some way? As I recall, it was, and I believe it was built in the Sewell Yard in the Kennebec River. Do you know the area of Port Clyde where the Leah Davis house now stands? Uh, prior to the, this house, uh, was there any, uh, were there any houses in the immediate area? Uh, I've always been told that there was a house there. Uh, the Davis had only told me that he built on an old cellar. And how far back would that go? The new house was built around 1870. And there was one before that? And there was one before that. A sailor's wife, living alone for months at a time, in a town she didn't like, with the burden of her duties weighing heavily on her. Heavily enough holds her things to have kept her long past her time. The problem is clear. Free her if he can. And she's alone now? Yes, she is. Is she aware of her passing? No, she's very concerned over the flocks. She says it's now come April, and it's time for shearing. Is she aware of the people in the house now? She wants to communicate. What does she want them to do for her? She wants to, for them to help her with the farm. 
She says it's too much. And she, the soil is all rocky. And she can't get labor from the town. She's having a terrible time. Can you see her? Yes, I do see her. Can she see you? Yes. Tell her that this is 1976 and that much time has passed. Does she understand this? She just keeps complaining. She has no one to write letters to. Does she understand that her husband has passed on, that she herself is a spirit? She's free to go. Does she She said to Kennybunk? Any place she wishes, to the city, or better to join her husband on the other side of life. She said, oh, what I would do for a townhouse. Ask her to call out to her husband to take her away. He's waiting for her. She, she's wanting to turn on the lights. She's talking about the oil lamps. She wants them all lit. Tell her the people here will take good care of the house, of the lamps, and of the land. And she's saying no tallow for the kitchen. Not to worry. And the root cellar is empty. Does she see him? Yes. Are they going off together? Only time will tell if Hans Holzer was successful. We've learned some things from Hans Holzer's ghost hunt at Port Clyde. Learn, for example, that if we accept the possibility that ghosts exist, we can begin to study their behavior in a systematic way. The study of ghosts is more than just a fascinating mental exercise, however. If Professor Holzer is right about ghosts being nothing more than people in trouble, it is our responsibility to help them. It would be nice to think that help would be available to us if our lives went awry, if our spirits were to move restlessly in the night. Lost civilizations, extraterrestrials, myths and monsters, missing persons, magic and witchcraft, unexplained phenomena. In search of cameras are traveling the world seeking out these great mysteries. This program was the result of the work of scientists, researchers, and a group of highly skilled technicians.